we have to do record, right? Okay. Yes. We are. Hi, Jamie. We just want to let you know, this is the first time we're using some new software. So we're all just getting acclimated right now. Um, and we are about to record this meeting. Your video is not, you're not on video though. So you don't have to worry about showing your face. <laughs> and I all just right. record, so we're good. Okay, great. Thanks, Amy. Uh, Welcome, my name is Yvette Bordeaux. I am uh, the director of the Master of Science in Applied Geosciences program here at the University of Pennsylvania. And Danielle is here. She is our administrative coordinator. And Amy Mulhern is part of our recruitment uh, group. So uh, we're all here to um, answer your questions. I'm gonna go through and um, do a little presentation about the program, but at any time, if you have a question, feel free to, um, there's a Q&A that you can put a comment in, and there's also the chat room. So uh, feel free to just uh, add your questions there. And I'm not sure, can, uh, can people unmute their microphone and ask questions as well, or is it just the chat Q&A? Again, it's new it's for just us. the chat Q&A. Okay, okay, yeah. great. So <laughs> yes. welcome, Jamie, and uh, we'll get started. All right, um, so this is a uh, professional master's program, the Master of Science in Applied Geosciences, which is slightly different than a research master's. And I always like to, to uh, um, point that out. So it's a focus on helping you find a job or obtain a promotion after graduation, as opposed to just going on for a PhD. Most research masters are, are sending you right into a PhD program. That is their sole focus. And if you don't get in, you're on your own to find a job. We do it the other way around. Our sole focus is to find you a job. And if you want to go on and do a PhD, we'll help you with that as well. All right. So that's not mutually exclusive, but our sole focus really is on getting you prepared to work in the field. All right, um, we have three program areas, environmental geology, hydrogeology, and engineering geology. So we'll talk about each of those. And you'll notice some pictures for all of these. Um, this is uh, a picture of Tony Sauter, one of our instructors in intro to hydrology out in the field with students showing them um, how to measure streams. All right, and I believe I missed a slide, so I'm gonna go back one. Um, a little bit about the program itself. The Master of Science in Applied Geosciences uh, was first started in 2005, and we already have over 100 alumni of the program. And the majority of them are in environmental consulting now. Some work for government agencies like the EPA, um, and others uh, work in businesses um, and um, other environmental groups, so uh, nonprofits, for example. Um, and towards the end, I'll talk about some of the companies that they're now working for. All right, now, um, we are part of the School of Arts and Sciences at the University of Pennsylvania. So uh, there are uh, 12 schools at Penn and we are a part of the School of Arts and Sciences, which is the largest school at the university. Um, we, uh, because the school is so large, they actually break the school down into three colleges and we are part of the College of Liberal and Professional Studies. And um, we are housed in the Department of Earth and Environmental Science. So here's a picture of Hayden Hall, which is our home department uh, building. And um, it's named after Ferdinand Vandeveer Hayden, who was a famous geologist and was once the state geologist of Pennsylvania. All right, so um, moving on. Why study in Philadelphia? Geology in Philadelphia do not necessarily immediately seem like, a you know, you always think about Colorado or Texas or someplace like that to study geology. Um, again, we are a professional master's program. And because of that, um, we are training you to go out and work in uh, areas such as environmental consulting, uh, cleanup of hazardous waste sites, um, and other um, environmental concerns. So um, I think that Philadelphia is actually a great place um, to study those sorts of things, right? So. Um, we're right near New Jersey, which has a lot of cleanup areas. Uh, certainly Pennsylvania has its own set of problems. Um, everything from acid mine drainage to buried waste, um, landfills and so forth. And New Jersey, of course, has also another set of, of issues similar to that. In addition, um, Philadelphia actually has committed, the water department has committed to green infrastructure to manage stormwater, which is a really new burgeoning field. And um, so we do train our students in looking at um, ways to manage stormwater using green infrastructure. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, in fact, this, the water department is so invested in this that they actually charge for stormwater runoff. So if your property um, happens to uh, have 
a certain amount of storm water rolling off of it after a one inch storm, uh, the city charges you a tax for that. So it, it's to encourage um, um, people to uh, find ways to control their stormwater runoff and keep it from um, uh, getting into the sewage system uh, quickly. All right. And so that has led to a whole bunch of really great opportunities for our students to learn about this type of management of warm stormwater. Uh, we also have the EPA Region 3 headquarters is in Philadelphia, and that has allowed for us to do a lot of different projects with them and also to meet and learn from these people. Um, in, in fact, some of the folks that work there come in and teach classes for us. Um, now, Penn, what about Penn and geosciences? Um, one of the big things that we like about is that our campus is a, a learning laboratory. It's a living learning laboratory. And one of the things, because Philadelphia is charging for stormwater runoff and we have a 300 acre campus in the city, uh, we have a lot of stormwater runoff. And so uh, Penn has put a lot of money and time into designing um, green infrastructure projects on the campus. And so here are two examples, Penn Park on the top and Shoemaker Green on the bottom. And both of, both of these are uh, dual purpose, right? So one of them is green infrastructure and the other is, you know, uh, either a nice park to sit in or um, athletic fields, right? So in both cases, they have buried cisterns under them um, that collect stormwater runoff to and allow the water to percolate into the ground. Or in the case of Shoemaker Green, the cistern is actually used to water the grass on top afterwards. All right, so um, our students have actually been working on a five year long term uh, uh, monitoring of Shoemaker Green um, to make sure that it is performing to the standards that it was designed for. In other words, bringing in the water, making sure it's clean, and that as it's being used on the on the grass, it's not killing the grass, right, with salts getting in and things like that. So um, our students have been um, doing grab samples and water quality analysis after every rainstorm um, to make sure that it's performing up to the standards that it was designed for. Um, because a lot of these green infrastructures are built, but we never, no one ever tests to see if they're actually effective. And so that's what our students are doing. So there's an opportunity to just walk across the street literally and do a project um, right on campus. So it's a lot of fun. All right, now, um, Next, another reason to study at the University of Pennsylvania is the Water Center at Penn. And I see that Danielle has already put in a link for the Water Center at Penn, uh, or I'm sorry, she put in for Philadelphia Water Department, which is awesome. Um, and then we have the Water Center at Penn. And the so Water Center at Penn is housed in the Department of Earth and Environmental Science, which is the department that we are in. And um, they work with faculty and outside groups on water policy issues, hydrology issues, water infrastructure, um, uh, recharge basins, all kinds of, of neat projects. And um, students have the opportunity to get involved in all of this research. Um, they're given research funding, there are internships, um, and all kinds of opportunities to work and publish with these uh, fellows in this program. All right, so um, I highly suggest that you check that out if you're interested. Uh, Danielle just put the link in the chat room. And um, uh, they are a fantastic resource and they're always looking for more students. They just put out another call for um, funding for students who are doing projects in the water area. Now a little bit about our faculty at Penn. We have two types of faculty. Um, the first type is our research faculty. So they're doing pure, and apply, uh, pure research and um, they're working in the areas of soils, um, climate change, mechanics of ice, and sediment transport. All right, so those are the major areas that they're working in. In addition, we have professional faculty. These are folks who are actually working in the field right now. So they're working in the environmental consulting companies, they're working at the US EPA and other areas. And uh, the majority of the professional faculty either hold a PG, a professional geologist license, or a PE, professional engineering license, or in some cases, both. All right, so they have a lot of experience and they're going to come into the classroom with real world examples uh, to apply to the, the, the uh, themes that they're talking about each night. And um, so many times we've had uh, students say to us, oh yeah, I had a class with Dr. Duda last night and then the next day I was able to use that in my work. All right, so that's because he's able to give examples of how he's using it in his work and then he can 
and then you can go out and use it the next day in your job. All right, if you have a job. So um, that's a pretty neat thing to be able to do. Now, a little bit about the curriculum. Um, it's a 12 course program. That's 36 semester hours. So each course is worth three is a three hour course. So uh, 36 semester hours. Seven of the courses are actually required courses and they expand your knowledge base in the geosciences. So it helps you with uh, areas you may have missed in undergraduate or you need to refresh on, right? And then there are two professional skills courses and three electives. All right, and you can see a picture here of uh, some of our students bailing a well right on the campus. So there's opportunities to do things all the time, and even though we're in the city. Um, and so just to go through that curriculum a little bit more closely, the seven required courses are here. And basically, these set the foundation for a strong geotechnical background. All right. Um, but even within these seven required courses, you have some options. So for example, the first one is geocomputations. If you're weak on calculus or you haven't done calculus in a while, you'll want to take the course called geocomputations, which is a calculus refresher to kind of get you back up to speed and it's because you'll be using calculus calculus in your other courses. All right, if you're good with your calculus, it's good, you don't need a refresher, you can take a statistics course, a geostatistics course, or you can take a course in geographic information systems, GIS. All right, so those are options. Intro to hydrogeology, groundwater hydrology, those are standard courses that everyone takes. You get to geomechanics and you have two choices, solids or fluids. When you get to, um, then geophysics in, uh, is a standard course, but then you get to geochemistry and you have the options of geochemistry, which is rock chemistry. You can take aqueous geochemistry, which is water chemistry, or you can take the um, biogeochemistry, which is a soil chemistry course. So depending on your focus and, and the field that you're planning to go into, you can choose which one of these is the best for you. And then again, you have options for engineering geology, you have soil mechanics or rock mechanics as, as options. So even though there are seven required courses, you do have some flexibility within the curriculum. Now, um, there are two professional courses that are required of everyone. Um, the first one is project management. So a lot of students are hoping to go into or already in um, environmental consulting and uh, most people want to eventually get out of the field and get into the office and um, move up in the organization. And in order to do that, you'll want to move into project management. Um, and uh, no better way to do that than to have a course in it on your resume uh, that will uh, prepare you to, to manage large projects. So we require project management. This was based on information that we got from our external advisory board who all said that students really should have strong writing skills and good project management skills. So we're helping you out with that. Um, the other course is a project design course and this helps you prepare for your capstone thesis at the end, um, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, but that's your research component. Um, here are some students at a Boulder field up in Northern Pennsylvania. All right, now, uh, the next part of your curriculum, so you have your seven required courses, your two professional courses, and then your three electives, right? And so the three electives are within one of these three areas, environmental geology, engineering geology, or hydrogeology. And alternatively, if none of these quite fit your goals, we can move you into an individualized concentration, and then you would work with one of our faculty advisors to create um, a set of courses that make sense for you. Okay, uh, occasionally a student has a, a professional goal that's outside the normal environmental consulting area where they want to go on for a PhD in a certain area <clears throat> and then we might adjust their courses uh, as an individual individualized concentration. Um, here's uh, uh, one of our students drilling in Puerto Rico at the uh, Liceo Critical Zone Observatory. This is where some of our students work. All right, now I'm gonna go through each of the three concentrations and show you some of the courses that are available. This is not all of the courses that are available. This is just a, a sampling. So for environmental geology, for example, you can take soils, earth systems and earth hazards, aqueous geochemistry, fundamentals of air pollution, stat, wetlands, and two forms of GIS, right? In engineering geology, you can take some of the similar courses like soils and earth systems and earth hazards, but you can also see that there are engineering geology courses in rock mechanics, surficial materials and processes. Um, the interpretation of near surface geologic um, 
is a, a course that is essentially a structural geology course for professional geologists. So what do you need to be effective in the field of environmental consulting? That's that course. Um, and of course, again, the GIS classes. And finally, hydrogeology, um, aqueous geochemistry, of course, we have two modeling courses, fate and transport of pollutants and geochemical modeling. Um, there's environmental groundwater hydrology, wetlands, and geomechanics fluids. And again, there are other options beyond these um, that are available to you as well. Um, so that brings us to our final piece of the program. So you have your 12 courses, and then you have to do a research project. And we call it project design or capstone. Um, it's like a in a research master's, you would do a research thesis and it would typically be some sort of theoretical project. Um, with us, we want you to do an applied project, so we call it project design instead. And the idea is that you would do something that would help you with your career goals to show off your skills that you've learned in the program and maybe help you get a promotion at work or to get into a job position that is uh, what you're looking for. Um, so we have you work with your current employer or a potential employer. We try to get something that needs to get done um, so that you can actually do that project for them. We've had a lot of uh, students do projects where, you know, there's a, there's a um, something that needs to be done at the company, but there's no client to pay for it. And um, they're like, well, someday we'd like to get this done, but we just don't have the time. A student will go in and do that project. All right. Um, we had a really fun one one year, a student, um, had a project where he was in western Pennsylvania and they would set up uh, um, generators to pump wells. So they'd have to pump the wells for, so they were putting in geothermal systems for houses that were being built in the area and they had to determine if the groundwater could support geothermal wells for this number of houses, right? And so they'd have to pump for a certain number of days, which is about a week, and then uh, go check that data. And if the, the well, if the groundwater could manage it, then they could put these systems in. Well, they would put them in and they'd turn them on and they would go away and they'd come back a week later. And for some reason, the generators would be off. It seemed as though they ran out of gas or somebody turned them off or something went wrong and they had to redo the test over and over and over again. And it was costing them lots of money to continuously do this. So he actually recommended doing just a 12 hour pump and then using that data and uh, mathematical formula to um, figure out, you know, what would this um, well be able to support um, all of these houses? And everyone was like, yeah, great idea. Let's do that. And then of course that, equation or that calculation that you would need to do didn't exist. So he worked with one of our professors in our department to create a mathematical model to figure that out, use the data and put put it into this mathematical model and came up with a response. And then what he did was he went out and actually did it physically, had it pumped for a week and made sure that it didn't get turned off at any point. And then he compared the data and they were able to tweak the model till it actually matched. And now that's being used all over out there as a, a quick way to um, uh, determine whether the groundwater can support geothermal wells. And so uh, he saved his company, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars in, in man hours um, by creating this, um, which is something that never would have been done otherwise, right? So it helped him, it helped him in his company, he got a promotion, he got a raise, and his company saved lots of money. So those are the kinds of projects that we're looking for. Um, some other things that we've had students do, a geophysical investigation of Pennsylvania Route 33 sinkhole project. Again, looking at a, a, a problem that is recurring in an area and seeing if we can find a solution. Um, we had another student who was an international student who was looking at landslide occurrences in Italy um, and trying to help predict these to help uh, keep this town safe. And then we had this uh, another example where there was a project done in New Jersey from, by a company and the student's company uh, determined there must be a fault there, but they couldn't figure out where it was. It was a buried fault and uh, they didn't have the time and manpower to go out and map it, but they really thought that would be useful for them uh, for future projects. So he went out and did that for his capstone. So uh, it, it's, uh, these are the kinds of things that uh, students um, are doing on a regular basis here. Um, now, because we are a professional master's program, there is a lot of professional development. Um, we have something called our first year retreat, and this is something that we do before you start your program. So it's usually the weekend before classes start, and uh, it's a, 
opportunity for you to meet your advisors. Uh, we work on networking skills. Uh, you get to hear from current students about their experiences in the program and examples of some of the research they're doing. And then we introduce you to all of the Penn resources. So this is like the first step. Um, we have traditionally had this off campus. Um, this year it was online, but uh, we're hoping to get back into the uh, classrooms and, and so forth soon. We also have a second year retreat about a month later. And in this case, uh, again, we talk about research opportunities because in the next semester you come into the program. We don't expect you to come into the program with a project and an idea of who you want to work with. We don't ask you to do that. We ask you to spend the first semester getting to know everybody in the department, meeting all the professors, learning about projects, and this is one place where you learn about them. And then in your second semester, you pick your topic and we help you um, identify your, your, the readers for your capstone, the people who will be your advisors or your committee. Okay, so um, that's a little bit different than a research master's where they expect you to come in saying, I want to work with this professor and this project. Um, we actually want you to come in and meet everybody, learn about everything, and then make the decision. Okay, um, so the second year retreat, you learn about research opportunities, um, you learn about finding jobs and internships. Okay, we'll give you ideas and again, alumni and um, current students talking about what they are doing right now and what the opportunities are to work with them on their projects. Uh, we also do some career advising, like negotiating salaries, and um, we usually have a happy hour at the end uh, where you meet uh, alumni from the area. So it's a, it's a networking opportunity where you get to apply your networking skills right away. So um, we also, for part of professional development, we have an alumni panel. Um, we typically hold this in the spring where uh, students invite six alumni from the programs and uh, they come in and then we have two students moderate it and ask questions and then they open up to the audience to ask additional questions. And this has been really productive in terms of um, the students have actually uh, uh, learned a lot about the field, what kinds of courses are the most uh, useful for them to take and also um, uh, they've actually um, ended up getting internships after meeting some of these folks. Um, this year because we are online because of COVID we um, are actually holding online virtual sessions and we've been holding mini alumni panels. We just had one yesterday and uh, so we have smaller numbers of alumni coming in on Zoom and talking to our students about what's up and what they're doing in their field and um, all the good stuff and students are able to interact and ask them questions as well. Um, something else that we do for you for professional development is we offer OSHA 40 hour HAZWOPER training. You may or may not have heard of that. Um, it's uh, through OSHA is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration and they have a 40 hour um, course that you take in order to become certified, which allows you to work in the field on certain types of projects. So it might be a hazardous waste site or a con potentially contaminated site, and you have to have this training in order to go on those sites legally, okay? Most companies don't necessarily need you to go out and do that, but they do need you to have the certification for their own insurance purposes. So if you have that on your resume, it means that you're more likely to get a job interview than someone who doesn't. Right? Because if they hire you and you do not have the certification, the first thing they have to do is send you out for a week to do the 40 hours of training. So they don't even get you for the first week. They can't get you started. If you already have the certification, they can throw you in day one and get you started on a project right away. So you're going to be more desirable. Um, you're more likely to get an interview and you're more likely to get the job than someone who has equal qualifications but doesn't have the certification. So we make sure that all of our students get this certification. We subsidize it. Um, it's typically uh, 32 hours online and then there's an eight hour dress out, which is what you're seeing here in this picture, um, where students put on the respirators and the Tyvek suits and the whole bit. Um, we've had students who got this in their first year and were able to obtain internships with consulting companies and um, in every single case, the students have said, oh, I got to go out in the field every day and the other interns had to stay in the office because they didn't have the uh, certification and the company didn't want to pay for them to get certified for an internship. Okay, so um, those students then got a lot of field experience that they could put on their resume while the other students could not do that. So it's a very valuable um, uh, a certification to get. And I highly recommend if you're heading into this field, whether you do our program or not, that you look into this. It is 
fairly pricey. We do subsidize it for our students. Um, and we make all the arrangements so they don't have to go off campus uh, to do it. So, um, We also recognize that our students are going out into the work world and that they would like to probably get uh, licensed, uh, professional geologist license. Now, not every state requires professional geology licensing, but um, uh, many of them do now and um, we provide the tools that you would need to get licensed. So the way that you get licensed is that first you have to take a professional geologist, uh, a fundamentals of geology exam, it's called the FG. Then you work under professional geologists or professional engineers for a certain number of hours. And once you reach the number of hours that are required, you can then sit for the final exam, which is the professional geologist licensure exam. All right, so it's a three-step process. Um, and our goal is to get you prepared to take that PG exam before you graduate and start accumulating hours towards the final exam um, while you're still a student. The, the program itself, if you complete the master's program, takes one year off the five-year requirement for the um, experience to take the exam. So you need five years of experience working under a PG or a PE. If you take our program, get the degree, then one year is taken off. Now, to be fair, any master's degree in geology, you can take one year off, okay? So that's just the master's degree level takes a year off. Um, but we're going to make sure that you get that um, FG exam done quickly so that you can start um, counting your time, even if you do an internship or if you're working professionally now, that time can start and you can start working towards that uh, final um, exam uh, for licensure, all right? Um, we have study groups of students to, to prepare for the fundamentals of geology exam. Um, but we also have two courses. So in, in the state of Pennsylvania, if you want to get your license here, um, there are two things that are required. You, you need a certain number of hours of geology courses under your belt, which you can get from our program. So even if you come in and you're not a geology major, um, you can get enough so that by the end of the program, you have enough hours in geology to uh, qualify for the exam. But you also need two courses that some folks do not get an undergraduate, even if they're geology majors, um, and but that the state requires that you have in order to sit for the exam. So that's structural geology and geology field course. And geology field course is the sticky one because you can't just say, oh, I had a bunch of courses where I went out in the field. It has to be a dedicated geology field course where you use Brunton compasses or Brunton, Brunton transits um, and measured rocks and the so forth. So it has to be a very specific course. We have both of those courses available and approved by the state. So if you don't have those on your transcript from undergrad and you need them, you can take them with us and then you will be qualified to take the exam. Now, a lot of people say, well, I'm not sure I'm going to work in Pennsylvania afterwards, so should I really worry about it? Fact of the matter is you could take the FG exam is the same exam no matter what state you're in. So if you take the FG exam in Pennsylvania, then you move to California, you can then do your five years of experience there and sit for the final um, professional geologist license there. Um, when you're done. Okay, so uh, we're really encouraging our students to take that FG exam while they're students here and start building their hours. Other field geology courses that are available to you at Penn, um, environmental geophysics has a field component where you're actually using geophysical GPR and so forth in the field. Intro to hydrology, you go out and measure streams. Um, and uh, a field study of soils, field methods of biogeochemistry and wetlands all have field components to them. Um, so uh, there's a question in the chat room or in the question Q&A uh, about um, requirements. We actually do not have a GRE requirement for this program. I don't know why. I have another program that I supervise in Earth and Environmental Science that does require it. MSAG does not. So MS Applied Geosciences, no GRE requirement. Now IELTS exam scores, I'll let uh, Danielle answer that question in the Q&A because I can't remember what the number is. Um, but if you need to do an IELTS uh, or TOEFL exam, uh, which is a test of English fluency, uh, we do have certain scores that we need. Okay. Um, and also, uh, we definitely have hydrogeology and we have options for GIS and remote sensing classes. We have both types of classes um, in the program. Um, now, a lot of students, uh, prospective students ask about what careers our students go into. Here's a bunch of our students at the All Ivy Environmental Career Fair, which is held at Columbia University every year. We uh, hire a bus and we take our students up to the career fair. Um, it's only open to Ivy League students. 
um, or alumni and um, a lot of our students have gone up and obtained jobs from that, right? So they've gone in and they've done on the spot interviews. There's a whole process. You put your resume in ahead of time, indicate which companies you're interested in. They take you into a separate room and they can, and we've had a number of students hired on the spot um, at this, at this um, career fair. Um, but these are some of the companies listed here that are where our students have gone um, recently. Okay. Uh, some of our alumni. And like I said, we have over 100 alumni now. So um, uh, you should be able to, uh, th there's a lot more companies than this. All right. Okay. Now, uh, we do have two dual degree options that you might be interested in. So if the MS in Applied Geosciences isn't enough for you, you need more. Uh, we also have a dual degree with the Master of Law in the law school. Um, this would give you a lot more of the regulation side of environmental consulting if you're interested in that. Um, it's a, uh, a pro it's a it's an eight course program, and you combine it with ours, and we reduce the full number of these um, uh, courses that you have to take. We double count courses, so it takes you less time to finish than if you did them separately. We also have um, a dual degree. Uh, it's actually a triple degree. Uh, called International Environmental Management, where at the end, you get a Master of Science of Applied Geosciences from the University of Pennsylvania. You get a post-master's degree in environmental management from Mean Paris Tech in France. And you get a uh, uh, Master of Science in um, Environmental Engineering from Tsinghua University in Beijing. Okay, um, and ideally, in a perfect world that's COVID free, you would go to uh, Tsinghua in the, uh, you would come here, do two semesters here, then you would go to Tsinghua in the fall. And um, then from there, you would go to Mean Puri Tech in the spring, and then you would do a six month internship, write that up and present that as your thesis for all three schools, and then obtain your, um, your uh, three master's degrees. So it's a really neat program. Um, I think we have a link for it that we can put up in the uh, a chat room for you. But uh, uh, I'm happy to talk about that later on. It's a, it's, a, it's a fun program. We actually have two MSAG students just finishing up that program right now. And it runs every year. Uh, but this group, they're just in their uh, uh, internship phase right now. Um, you can also, if an extra degree or two is not what you're really looking for, you can do a certificate in addition to your degree. So you can get the Master of Science in Applied Geosciences, and you can get a certificate in Geographic Information Systems. And so that might apply, uh, be uh, attractive to some of you um, that are looking for remote sensing, GIS, that sort of thing. There's a whole certificate available. It's a six-course uh, certificate. Sorry, five course certificate. Um, you can double count two of those courses back to the M MSAG program, which means that you would only have to take three additional courses to get this additional certificate. Um, there's also a resilience and adaptation certificate and an energy policy certificate. And then law school has a law certificate. If you don't wanna go for the full dual degree, you can just do a five course certificate instead. All right, so those are all available to you. Um, I did want to uh, leave some time for questions, but I'm just going to give you a quick overview of a couple more things. One is our student groups. Um, we have a graduate advisory board and they sponsor, these are students, uh, student government um, within our programs. Uh, they're representatives from both the applied geosciences and from the environmental studies master's degree that we have in our department. And um, they host the alumni career panel, panel every year. They host coffee hours. You can see the yummy donuts here. Um, all student meetings, happy hours, ice skating, whatever you guys want to do, um, they're the ones that uh, organize it. So there's been haunted houses and wine tasting, all sorts of fun things, rock climbing, all sorts of fun things like that. We have a couple of student chapters on campus. We have a student chapter of the Association of Environmental and Engineering Geologists. And this is the group that typically is, uh, forms the study group for the Fundamentals of Geology exam for that licensure. Um, but they also present posters at our local national meet and national meetings um, and do some of the career work with them. We also have a student chapter of the American Water Works Association. And um, again, students attend student nights, professional networking events and conferences um, associated with them. And there's a lot of scholarships and other things associated with that group. Um, if you want to get involved in publishing, we have something called WH2O, the Journal of Gender and Water. And um, this is a uh, print and electronic 
um, journal that has been, uh, I think we're in our seventh year now, and um, there's opportunities for you to serve as an editor for this. Uh, generally, when an article is, comes in from somebody, any, any researcher in the world submits an article to the journal. Uh, we have one faculty member and one student review it and make a decision on whether or not to accept it for the journal. And then you work with the author to make any edits or, or, or fixes to it before it is accepted to the journal for publication. So you can get involved as an editor, you can get involved, you can write your own pieces, um, you can be part of the blog, um, and you can um, get uh, involved in the actual design and layout of each journal um, issue. So that's available on our uh, Scholarly Commons, which is um, our online um, electronic journal um, at Penn. Um, so I think uh, Danielle will throw a link in there for you. We also have, if that's not enough for you, you don't, you know, you get some dual degrees and some certificates and, and journals and all that stuff. We also have extracurricular activities that you can um, participate in, like um, there's the Patagonia case competition that runs every year. And one of our MSAG students here at Dell, uh, uh, they got third place uh, last year, which was pretty exciting. Um, that was that group there included a master of science and applied geosciences student, a master of environmental studies student, and then some Wharton students and some students from the school of design. So it was a real true interdisciplinary team uh, that made it to third place on their first try. Um, we have the EPA Rainworks Challenge, which is to design a green infrastructure project on our campus in an area that has chronic flooding. Um, so they'll be submitting their, um, their project uh, to the EPA next month. And uh, we have an ongoing project with intractable problems in West Virginia, which is water issues in that area. Um, and so we have a lot of students working on that issue, uh, both as uh, project design or capstones, and also um, as part of the Water Center, um, some of their work. So if that's not enough, we do have some other opportunities. Um, students can also do research off campus with some of our local groups. Uh, one of them is the Takuni Takoni Frankfurt Watershed Partnership. They're always looking for folks to do projects on their stream. The Northern Research Station of the USDA, so they do a lot of uh, watershed, micro watershed work. And the Stroud Water Research Center, um, which works on freshwater streams um, and riparian zones um, in Chester County. So uh, lots of opportunities to work with them as well. Um, in terms of publishing, you are absolutely encouraged to publish. You're not required to, but if your goal ultimately is to go on for a PhD, either immediately or three to four years after working, um, we encourage you to publish. You can publish your independent study work, your project designs, any extra projects that you do. Again, collaborating with faculty at Penn. Uh, we absolutely encourage you to do it. Here's a picture of one of our uh, graduate research conference poster sessions. And we have a series of different poster sessions throughout the year to show off your work and uh, let people know what you're doing. Um, so there's a question about funding opportunities for international students for fall. Uh, what are the chances of acceptance uh, since I'm interested to apply. So um, I'll get to the funding piece towards the end, but basically there's no uh, direct funding for any student, international or domestic. Um, these programs are not subsidized. However, we do have teaching assistant positions. We have research assistant positions and things like that, um, but they're competitive, so you have to apply for them. Um, you can also attend conferences and we've had students present and just attend conferences. Uh, students participate in World Water Weeks in Stockholm, World Water Forum, which will be in, um, in uh, Senegal this year, though we think it may end up being online, unfortunately. Um, and then the Geological Society of America, Association of Environmental Engineering Geologists. So lots of opportunities. Here's Chris um, at a, a mine reclamation conference in West Virginia, which was helping him with his research. Um, we really encourage students who are not already working to get an internship and we help you try to find those. Um, here, uh, this student actually ended up uh, doing an internship with Freeport McMoran, uh, which is a mining company, and um, he was able to then obtain a job uh, from that position. And in fact, he helped another student get a job at the same company a year later, so that was really neat. And we find that that's true with our alumni, is that they're really, really supportive and helpful in helping other MSAG students find jobs uh, when they graduate. So all students should try to get these uh, uh, for the experience. 
and um, we have local consulting firms that we direct you to. We have the EPA nearby. Um, there's, again, their Urban Research Station, the Delaware River Basin Commission. There's a lot of opportunities right here in Philadelphia. And we're really just a train ride away from New York and Washington, D.C., so there are opportunities there as well. Um, we also encourage you to attend the special events like the All Live Environmental Career Fair and the Graduate Research Conference to meet people and to learn more about opportunities. And then just some quick things about the program stats. Um, right now, we have about 48 active students in the program this semester. 30 are about our part-time, which means they're taking one or two classes a semester. Most of them are working. The rest are full-time, and they're taking three or four classes a semester. All right. Um, our international student population is about 17% of our group, and here are some of the countries that they're from currently. Um, and this is our wetlands class out at uh, Maurice River in New Jersey. Our international students, um, just so you know, the MSAG is a STEM program, which means that you have the extra time for um, OPT, the STEM extension. Um, we have opportunities for curriculum practical training, which means that you can get an internship, a paid internship in the United States and work um, during the summer if you want to. And then of course, you're able to get the STEM OPT once you graduate. Um, typical majors that come into the program, um, Geology, of course, or geosciences, earth sciences, environmental sciences, but we also hear it see students from engineering and chemistry and math, typically from the sciences. Um, occasionally, we've had one student that came in for, with economics. She had to take a few remedial classes to kind of catch up on the geology, but she caught up. Um, and so certainly if you're doing a career change or your, your undergraduate is in something, something other than these, we can talk about ways for you to kind of prepare for the program so that you're not too far behind when you start jumping into the graduate level classes. All right, employment rates in the last three years, we have had 100% employment in geoscience fields for all of our students. So everybody has been getting jobs. A lot of them are getting jobs before they graduate. So they'll do an internship in the summer between their first and second year. And then they often get converted to full employment before they graduate. In addition, the All Ivy Environmental Career Fair has been fantastic for our students in terms of getting them job offers. And that's usually in like late February, early March. And some of our students have been given job offers and said, oh, but I'm not really ready yet. And they're like, that's okay. Come in June when you're done and you can start then. So that's worked out really well for many of our students. All right, so next steps. Um, our application deadlines, if you're thinking of coming this year, this, this next semester, that's January 2021, the deadline is November 1st, all right? Um, if you're looking to start in the fall, which is uh, late August, uh, the deadline is April 1st. We also have a priority deadline for the fall, which is December 15th. So if you're pretty sure you want to come, you might want to go for that priority deadline. It gives you a little bit of an edge because uh, we have a certain number of students that we take and um, they'll, they'll, you know, review those applications first and then the rest of them we review on a rolling basis. So um, until we're full, basically, but we're, we're going to save a few slots for the folks that don't apply until April 1st and then, but you'll be, there'll be more competition for those slots because they're holding them all right towards the end. So uh, there may be like five slots and 10 or 15 students applying for those five slots where if you apply earlier, you have a better chance. Okay, so there's that. Um, for our application, we require, um, there's an online application. There are three essays. Um, how did you become interested in geosciences? What would you like to study while you're here? And then what would you like to do career-wise or what would you like to do next when, once you get your degree? Are you going on for a PhD? Are you um, looking for a position at a certain type of company or organization, that sort of thing? Uh, there's an application fee, official transcripts from all colleges and universities attended. Um, we actually only need unofficial from the United States. Um, if they're from outside the United States, we need to have them evaluated by WES or one of the other evaluating services. Um, and those have to be official, but the you can do unofficial if it's US. And then if you are admitted, then you have to submit your official transcripts. Um, we need a resume and um, two letters of recommendation. If your first language is not English, we'll also need a TOEFL score or an IELTS 
um, test score, all right? No GRE requirement. Uh, and now for funding your education, a lot of our students fund their education through subsidized student loans. Um, many, many of our students actually have tuition benefits from their companies. In some cases, our students have, um, uh, are coming from companies that have tuition benefits. So they heard about our program and came in through their company. Um, there are external scholarships that students obtain either through their government, through, um, through outside scholarships like the National Science Foundation, uh, the Society for Women Environmental Professionals. There's a whole series of different places that you can go for external scholarships. We do have TA positions. They are semester to semester and they pay a thousand dollars a month. So they're not going to cover tuition, but they will maybe help with living expenses. Um, we also cover uh, things like um, uh, if you want to go and give a, a, a paper presentation or a poster presentation at a conference, we can help you with the travel costs and registration fees for that. Um, we have awards, research awards, if you are doing research and you need money uh, to attend uh, or you know travel somewhere for a field research um, or if you need equipment to do your research, um, we can help you with that. Um, okay. All right, so that was a lot. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I saw there were a few questions in there. I think uh, um, Danielle was able to answer most of them or I was able to answer them. But if you have any other questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A box or in the chat room. And I know there's a lot of information in the chat room. Um, so can you, the question is, can you receive transfer credit for undergraduate courses, um, for example, a soil course? The answer is no, actually. Um, we can, we don't accept undergraduate courses for this graduate program, okay? So, uh, but we could accept a, a graduate level course from, like if you went to community college or something like that where they had a graduate level course in soils and you took that, um, we can accept up to two uh, transfer courses from outside of the university. But they have to be graduate level and they have to have not counted towards another degree. Okay. Um, and they, basically you submit the syllabus and the form and then our faculty evaluate it and they feel it's up to the pen level, then they'll accept it as transfer credit. It's a good question. But if you had a soil course as an undergraduate, you could, um, you know, not take that here, or you can take it an alternative course. You know, we have one question in the chat. Oh, I'm sorry, in the Q and A, Jamie Hernandez is asking, what uh, will the number of classes be per semester? Okay, so I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go with two things here. So if you uh, want to be full time, you would take three or four courses a semester. If you want to be part-time, you would take one or two courses per semester. Okay. Um, now, within that, but beyond that, uh, the other side of that question might be, the answer might be, uh, we offer six classes within the Master of Science and Applied Geosciences every semester. So it's six in the summer, or six in the fall, six in the spring, and four in the summer. All right. In addition, you are, have the opportunity to take some courses in our sister program, the Master of Environmental Studies program. So our GIS classes are offered through the um, Master of Environmental Studies program. So you're able to take those courses. The wetlands course is part of the Master of Environmental Studies course, but it's about 50% Master of Environmental Studies students and 50% Master of Science and Applied Geosciences in the class, right? So um, though we only offer six within the program itself, which are very, very specific geoscience courses like geophysics, engineering, geology, geomechanics, you, all these other courses um, are available um, in outside of that. So in any one semester, you may have 14 to 20 courses to choose from. Okay. So it's always, we, you work with an academic advisor every semester to make sure that you're getting the right classes in the right sequence. Also, our courses are at night. Um, we were originally um, uh, designed for environmental professionals that are working full time. So all of our classes are at night after five o'clock. However, 
you are able to take day classes if you want. So there are day classes being offered in our department and in other schools. And like, for example, if you go for the GIS certificate, some of those courses are during the day. So you are able to take daytime classes. But we find our students, even if they're full-time students, if they're taking night classes, then their day is free to be able to do research with the water center or with the faculty or get an internship to get some experience, that sort of thing. So it's worked out well for both the full and part-time students. So I hope I answered your question. Uh, so uh, the question is, what is the requirement for an international in case of holding a Master of Science from the U.S.? Um, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking there. Uh, if you have a Master of Science from the U.S., um, do you mean like in terms of submitting transcripts or? I would say that uh, if you're if you're asking about submitting transcripts, oh, there we go, Jamie. You can actually unmute your mic if you want and just ask the question. Are you listening to me? Listen yes. To me? Yes. Thanks. Okay, yeah, I, my question is uh, just if uh, there is. I mean, I hold a master from uh, from from my uh, U.S. university. Is there, is there a, I do need a TOEFL or not? Um, so usually what you would do then is just send an email to LPS at SAS, uh, the emails on the application, and um, just ask for a, a TOEFL waiver. Um, if you took a TOEFL to get into your other program and it's still valid, you can just throw that score in. Uh, but otherwise, you can just uh, request a, a waiver and you just say in the email that you're wa you request a waiver because you already have a degree in the U.S. All right. Good questions. Anybody else have anything? Um, so the question is how to get enrolled in the PhD program. Um, do you mean at Penn or just in general? At Penn. Okay, so the requirements to get into the Penn PhD program are slightly different. Um, there's a separate application for the PhD program. And in that case, unlike with our program where we want you to just come in and meet everybody and then determine who you'll work with and what project you'll work on, there when you're applying to, that P to the PhD program in Earth Environmental Science, you would want to um, know which uh, professor you want to work with immediately and you would want to talk about that in your essays about what kind of project you'd like to do and hopefully that would be uh, similar to what those professors are working on, right? So. Um, if you're if you're interested in you know carbon and soils, for example, you'd want to work with Dr. Plant, and um, you would want to talk about that in your essays. They do have a GRE requirement and a TOEFL requirement, um, and um, otherwise, I think it's it's similar. You know, recommendation letters, transcripts, and that sort of thing. I don't know if uh, Danielle, if you can find the link to their application it's, uh, page on the department's uh, the website. PhD program. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. She'll find that for you and, and put it up. So again, yeah, if you already have a master of science, it might make more sense to go on for a PhD um, rather than get a second master's degree, um, unless the master's degrees are very different, right? And you're preparing yourself for a, a PhD. Um, our 
master's program isn't necessarily the best choice if you're heading towards a PhD and that's your goal because we are really focused on getting folks jobs. Um, we can though have set you up to work with a faculty member in the department doing research and hopefully getting published before um, you apply to grad school. Um, we can do that for you. But again, if you already have a master's degree, it may not be worth it. All right, right the link just... um, is in the chat for Earth and Environmental Science PhD program. Thanks. All right, any other questions? We're coming up on uh, one o'clock Eastern time. So the procedure will be a little bit different from uh, from the masters uh, for the PhD. Uh, the application, you mean, or? Yeah, the application. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a slightly different application. It's still the same application system, but they have different essay questions, um, and uh, again, a slightly different requirement. For example, we do not have a GRE requirement for the master's program, but we do for the PhD program. Okay. Same people reviewing, but you know they're thinking about it in a different way, right? Because for the PhD, they're looking to um, um, they're looking to, uh, to figure out if you would be a good fit in their research program. Whereas with the master students, we bring you in and then you meet them and you get to know them and then you determine whether or not you know it, it's a, just a different. Um, way of coming into the program. Uh, the other thing I just remembered, um, they're actually, the School of Arts and Sciences uh, has frozen all PhDs uh, for the fall semester. So in other words, they're not taking applications in any department for the fall. Um, just because of COVID, they don't feel it's fair because they, you really should be working one-on-one -on -one with your professor. And until COVID clears up, they've decided not to take um, in new PhD students for the fall. Um, we are still taking master students uh, because we have a different model um, where you can work remotely, uh, but for those students, um, they're not taking students for the fall. So, and I don't know if that's university wide or just the arts and sciences. Um, it's just arts and sciences because I know for chemistry, they've taken that and they are reducing the number of PhDs by 20% for five years. So it's equivalent, but their applications aren't closed completely. Okay. And they're part of arts and sciences. They're just a different department. Okay. So some departments are doing that. So you could check Earth and Environmental Science. I, the last I heard, they were not taking new students for the fall, but if there is a professor who has a grant, they can take a student. I think that's just univer the arts and sciences has said no new students that are on, on school funds. All right, well, it's one o'clock. I thank you all for coming. And um, do let us know if you have any questions. Um, you can, uh, we can put our email in the chat room for you. And you can reach out to us directly if you have any questions or concerns or if something pops up later or if you want to meet individually, we're here to help. All right. Thanks so much.